The COVID-19 pandemic humbled the aviation industry and it also taught it a lot of important lessons. Lessons that couldn't be learnt without forcing the entire world into their homes for two straight years. In 2019, prior to the pandemic, despite a booming aviation industry, capacity was freely available across any airline in the world practically. And so the focus for airlines then was to make their fleet more versatile by scaling down to narrow body aircraft so that they could be more specific with how much capacity they could make available across their network. Experts across the industry were speculating that the days of the A380 were over because the operating cost of a flight usually outweighed the revenue brought in by an operating flight. And so most airlines that operated the A380 were already beginning to phase them out despite the aircrafts being less than 10 years old on average. As you'll probably know, there are exceptions to this. Well, that is to say one notable exception, but we'll talk about that later in the video. As some might expect, when you're stuck inside for two years, the first thing you want to do when you're let out is go somewhere else. And that's exactly what happened for the majority of the world. The airline industry was back open for business and suddenly the entire industry was completely backhanded by a huge demand for air travel. But for airlines, it's not as easy as just putting on more flights in major ports like London or Sydney or New York. No, no, because there is this little thing called a slot constraint and it is in place for many airlines across the world as most ports try to be fair in the way they dish out available gates or available departure or arrival slots at their airports coming out of the pandemic. A good example of this is if you're in Australia, you're probably familiar with the current Qatar Airways situation where the federal government has blocked Qatar Airways request for 18 additional slots per week for aircraft to arrive in major ports such as Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. So for an airline that has a higher demand than available seats on a route that they serve, they are faced with an issue unique to the post-pandemic world, which is to say that suddenly they need to find a way to increase capacity on their aircraft because they can't put on extra flights to the routes that they serve. Enter the A380, the aircraft once neglected by most airlines that operated it pre-pandemic, suddenly the most useful tool in this post-pandemic world. Airlines that once said that they would never use the A380 again are forced to use it. Take Qatar Airways, for example, the very same airline that is facing slot restraints in Australia currently an airline that swore they would not use the A380 again, they were done with it, it was not efficient, it was not a money maker, it was not something they were interested in using at all, suddenly forced to use the A380 on routes where they can't gain additional slots. And why? Because it's the only way that you can increase the capacity available to the market where you have a higher demand than what you can make available. Which finally, three minutes into the video, brings us to the reason in which I have made this video. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a new entrant into the aviation market that comes to us with four A380s and they have the opportunity to show if it's possible to run a low cost carrier with A380s. I give you Global Airlines. So a low cost carrier using an A380 is obviously pretty bold, right? But adding capacity to an A380 to maximize its value is nothing new. Emirates has been doing it for a long time now. So let's start by looking at that. From its very inception, Emirates have always seen the true value of the A380 and they're the only ones that have made it work for them rather than against them by making their entire fleet centered around the A380. Obviously being geographically poised for success, a hub and spoke network is their primary mode of operandum and that's what they use the A380 on. A380s fly in and out of Dubai simultaneously connecting passengers from one route to another but they managed to fill up A380s time and time again on every route that they fly. They managed to do it. Not that it's relevant to what we're talking about now, but they showed that with the A380, you have to either be all in or not in at all. Uh, you can't be half in with a small fleet of, say, six A380s. And I'm looking at you, Thai Airways. Right, so even from the early days of using the A380 across their network, Emirates could see that in order to meet the demand available on routes, they had to maximize the capacity of each aircraft that they flew in and out of a given airport. So already in 2015, they were looking at increasing the number of seats on their A380s by ripping out first class. Where Airbus states the average capacity of an A380 is 525 passengers, Emirates were looking to fit in 615 seats on their aircraft by ripping out first class. While as a legacy carrier, you could ordinarily turn the same amount of revenue with one first class seat as you could with, say, five economy seats, Emirates saw clear value in ripping out first classes. The world is 
white, obviously turning away from it and just putting in more economy. So that was done eight years ago and realistically it was only done because it aligned perfectly with their business strategy, which is to put bums on seats, fill up to the maximum possible capabilities and get passengers from one place to another. And while Emirates were able to fill up an A380 time and time again, other carriers, not so much which is why in 2019, a lot of carriers around the world were faced with an issue of having more capacity available than what the demand called for. The universal business strategy then became to convert your wide body fleet into a more narrow body focus so that you could better thread the needle of how much capacity you can offer in comparison to the demand that is sought. Now, a business decision like this makes a lot of sense for something like a low-cost carrier, not so much for a legacy carrier or a carrier that's propped up by its national government, but for carriers like, say, Jetstar or EasyJet or Ryanair, it makes sense to have an entirely narrow fleet almost because you can be more versatile with how much capacity you add to each route that you serve. Let's take Jetstar, for example, right? Let's just say on a given day, they have way more capacity available on a route on a given day than seats booked, but yet on other routes, they are filled to the absolute maximum. They can downgrade one flight from an A321 to an A320 and then utilize that same A321 on a route that it's better utilized on. It makes sense, right? Be more fluid with your fleet to allow you to have the maximum uplift and make the most money possible. And this isn't new, this is done across the world. Even Ryanair take, for example, their 737 MAX 10s versus 737 MAX 8s or even 737 800s. Each has a different capacity and each can be utilized on a different route depending on the time of day, depending on the amount of people that need to fly from one place to another. Now, before some of you come at me in the comments, yes, I know a lot of low-cost carriers don't necessarily have hubs of operations where you can just willy-nilly shift one aircraft to another route because there's not so many aircraft available in one location at any one time, but it's still possible. It just takes a bit of creativity. And as has been explained before, and as most of you watching these videos probably know, the low-cost carrier model, the entire business strategy is to put bums on seats for the lowest cost possible to the consumer. There is a market there and it is a market that needs to be served. So. What would happen if you flew major routes with an A380 packed to the absolute rafters with passengers in a low-cost carrier business model? Well, that's a question we could soon have an answer to because global airlines come to us with four A380s that I have purchased, not least, purchased. And while they're not currently seeking to run a low-cost business model, I think they have a really unique opportunity to see if they can make it work. Does the A380 work with the pay to sit and that's it business model? Firstly, let's take a look at Global Airlines and see what they're about and see what they're intending to do. Global Airlines is a British startup airline aiming to begin operations from London to New York City and Los Angeles in spring of 2024 using four Airbus A380s. They bought their first A380 in May of 2023 and they're the first new buyer of an A380 in eight years and certainly the first since the pandemic. The airline is the brainchild of millionaire av geek James Asquith, a man who has visited all 196 countries in the world and owns the business Holiday Swap, which is a website that allows people to use their home as a holiday destination and swap with others in different countries to make holidaying easier. James and the team at Global Airlines claim to be breaking the aviation norms by setting up this airline and flying routes out of London Gatwick Airport to major cities around the world. Okay, well, look, let's just take a step back here and look at Global Airlines from an outsider's perspective. Passionate and eccentric billionaire attempts to start up airline claiming that they're going to be different to every other airline finally giving customers the experience that they deserve when traveling on an airline. I mean, come on guys, I can name at least five wealthy people off the top of my head that have said that they're starting an airline that will break the mold of the aviation industry. And sometimes it works, but most of the time it really does not work. Of course, we have the Richard Bransons, the AJ Sins of the world, the ones that have broken that mold and have created a dynasty for themselves in the airline industry. But those circumstances are truly unique, especially AJ Sin, right? He 
is responsible for SpiceJet, an airline that is breaking into the Indian aviation industry, a highly untapped market with so much air travel potential. So many customers just sitting there waiting to be utilized. James Asquith, on the other hand, is intending to fly an A380 at a regular legacy carrier fare price on a route that is so competitive and that already has so many airlines attempting to fill seats and serve demand. I mean, guys, listen, this is, this is literally their vision statement, all right? We are revolutionizing commercial flying. We've all suffered for far too long with long security queues, late flights, lost luggage, inedible food, and constant poor customer service. Global Airlines offers fast relief from the aches and pains associated with commercial air travel. We bring joy at every interaction and delight at every touch point. Take a deep breath. Welcome on board. Whether you are flying for business or leisure, Global Airlines do things differently, from catering and customer relations through to scheduling and ground operations. Simply put, we are unconstrained by the usual aviation paradigms. This new ethos sets to raise the bar in the world of aviation. A word of warning, once you get used to Global Airlines, it is very hard to go back to anything else. I mean, really, seriously, do they actually think that they are that much different to any other airline? There are airlines that exist that offer products that are so insane that no consumer in their right mind could ever expect the level of luxury that's actually offered to them. I mean, this vision statement is the most intricate way of saying absolutely nothing at all. There is nothing of value in it, and their claim to do things differently to other airlines is yet to be seen, and I don't think it will be seen, to be completely honest with you. I mean, I said it about Thai Airways, and I said it again. You have to either be all in with the A380 or not in at all, and four aircraft is simply not enough to make the A380 work for an airline. I mean, at one stage, they were genuinely going to offer something called a gamer class separate class that is a hybrid of business class and a gaming setup. You could literally just play video games on board and that was the product you were playing for. Just absurd. Okay, so I think we get a rough picture of how the current vision of Global Airlines is a bit convoluted and played out. But let's shift the narrative a little bit. Let's say Global Airlines decide that they're actually going to shift their aim towards becoming a low cost carrier. Then what happens? As mentioned, some of Emirates A380s run with 606 seats on board in a two-class configuration. But Airbus has noted that the A380 is actually rated to carry 853 passengers when configured at maximum capacity. So right off the bat to begin with, you can see that you can fit close to 1,000 passengers on board an A380 per flight in a single class configuration. And you're thinking, well, okay, no airline's actually gonna do that. But look, it's happened with the A330neo. Cebu Pacific filled their A330-900s with 459 seats. That is insane. Okay, so what's the next box to tick? Well, uh, most low-cost carriers run with a single type of aircraft to reduce maintenance cost and training costs associated with pilots. We can already tick that box because we know that they've only got A380s. Only four of them, but only A380s. But let's go back and hone in on that maintenance cost thing for a second there because that is important to a low-cost carrier. And it's also a reason why most low-cost carriers across the world utilize primarily narrow-body fleets because narrow-body aircraft are cheaper to maintain on a year-on-year -year basis. For comparison, a common year-on-year -year estimate for maintenance costs associated with the A320 comes in at fifteen dollars to $30,000 per year. Compare that to the A380 where the yearly maintenance cost averages out at a whopping $1 million a year. That far and beyond exceeds the maintenance cost per seat revenue associated with a low cost carrier on a narrow body configuration versus the A380. Where an A321neo can run with 232 seats and a maintenance cost per year of $30,000 on average, that comes out at roughly $130 per seat per year associated with maintenance costs. Note that that's per year, not per flight. So obviously it's very low in the grand scheme of things given how many flights an A320 will do in a single year. Now compare the cost of maintenance associated with each seat if you were to run an A380 with a maximum capacity configuration of 853 passengers per year you're looking at a whopping $1,170 per seat per year maintenance cost. 
That is insane. Not to mention the fact that on average, the A380 will fly less flights per year than an A320. So yeah, maintenance costs are pretty high. And I will give Global Airlines credit in the sense that they have just penciled a deal with HiFly to make maintenance and development a little bit easier throughout the life of their A380s. But it doesn't excuse the fact that it's still going to be very expensive. Okay, so now let's look at the fact that Global Airlines have purchased these four A380s outright rather than lease them from a third-party company. A dry lease or wet lease with a third-party company often holds great value to a low-cost carrier because often it allows them to be very versatile with how they utilize their fleet. Let's say that an aircraft that is wet leasing 20 aircraft and crew, but they don't have the demand to meet all of the aircraft serving on those routes. Suddenly, they can just take one of those aircraft and send it back to the leaser. Now, you can't do that if you own the aircraft, can you? You've just got to straight up sell it. And then what happens if demand comes back? What happens if capacity grows? Suddenly, you don't have the aircraft there to be able to serve the required demand. There's far less versatility and you are locked in to the level of capacity that you're able to offer because you can't really do anything about it. And that is what Global Airlines have done. Before they've even begun serving any of the routes, before they're even up in the air, they've got four A380s, they've outright purchased them all. And if they get hamstrung into not being able to fill up any of those A380s on a given route, they either have to find a new route or they're just gonna have to can that A380 entirely. And then, not to mention the fact that I don't even think that Global Airlines have their Air Operators Certificate yet. And what's to say that they're going to be granted that? They have put such a huge stake into this airline before it's even off the ground or even allowed to fly the planes that they've purchased. It's very bold. Okay, so this deal with high flight, right? There's potential, especially if Global Airlines want to become a low-cost carrier, there's potential that this deal could be very beneficial to Global Airlines because high flight can offer them cabin crew, they can offer them pilots, they can offer them catering, they can offer them cleaning, they can offer them refueling. They have infrastructure in place to allow contracts that exist between HiFly and those kinds of companies to help out global airlines on the ground in various ports around the world. So it could be very beneficial to them. So I guess they're not locked in when it comes to the services side of things. Now, if we look at the routes that an LCC carrier with A380 should serve, none of them whatsoever align in any way with the routes that global airlines intend to serve currently. I mentioned AJ Sin at SpiceJet a moment ago, and SpiceJet sit directly in the middle of a truly untapped market with plenty of demand to serve. Now, I won't go into great detail about why the A380 is perfect for the Indian travel market as it develops, because that has already been covered in detail by one of the aviation YouTube greats. Kobe explains and I'll link his video at the top right now for anyone that wants to know more about why it is that India is the ultimate untapped aviation market right now. So needless to say Global Airlines' route network needs to shift away from populous legacy carrier routes such as London to New York or London to Paris or routes like that, maybe Dubai as well, and shift more towards routes that have a high demand and has the capacity available to fill up an A380 like the Indian air travel market and also eventually like the African air travel market. We haven't spoken about that yet, but uh, I'm sure there'll be a video coming out about that soon. So should Global Airlines decide to use their A380s in a low cost carrier business strategy? Those are just a few things that they would have to consider before switching to that business model. Now, ultimately, where would they land in terms of making the low cost carrier model profitable with the A380? Well, I think it's safe to say, looking at the numbers, that the primary way to bring operating costs down lies with the maintenance costs of the A380. It's much larger than that of the narrowbody fleets that most low-cost carriers operate with, and so finding a way to service the aircraft for pennies on the dollar is one of the main ways in which global airlines could keep their airline profitable in a low-cost carrier configuration. And so we come to the answer for should Global Airlines operate their A380s in a low-cost carrier strategy? The answer is no, I think. Not unless they can find a way to sustainably bring down those operating costs. But then again, should Global Airlines be utilizing the A380 to begin with? Also no. 
Do I think that Global Airlines will last in the long term? No. Do I think that their strategy for competing directly with high-powered legacy airlines as a luxury carrier is a smart idea? No. But still, I would love to see them use those A380s as a low-cost carrier. That would be so cool because it's not something that anyone has ever really comprehended outside of Kobe Explains, obviously. Okay, well, that's my two cents on Global Airlines. What do you guys think? Do you think Global Airlines is going to last very long? Do you think that an A380 could be used as a low-cost carrier? Do you think that they should use it as a low-cost carrier? Do you think there are any creative ways in which they can bring down maintenance and operating costs in order to make it work? I want to hear all about it in the comments. I'm sure I've missed a few things. This is a very light summary in comparison to that of some other people who have covered the topic on this YouTube platform, but... I would love to hear from you guys nonetheless in the comments. Until next time, it's been lovely and I will see you later. Bye.